All right, thank you everybody for coming. Um, we probably should have had the musical number last. I'm afraid that the, uh, the event's already peaked and it's all downhill from here. So <laughs> that's a tough act to follow. Um, so a little background on me. Um, so I'm a corporate and securities attorney. Um, I do a lot of business transactions, you know, securities offerings, um, you know, any kind of business contract basically. So I got into blockchain about probably nine or 10 months ago. Um, I had heard about Bitcoin when it first came out, but it, it didn't really, you know, resonate with me. But I kept, you know, I kept hearing about it every so often, something else would come up and I'd, I'd keep hearing about it. And I kept hearing about these kind of top tier venture funds that were investing in the space. And I kept thinking, man, what am I missing on this? And then, you know, a little while back, I kept seeing all of these articles about blockchain and all these different use cases of what you could use the blockchain for. And so I just started thinking, what in the world is the blockchain? And so once I started to read about blockchain, that's when the light kind of went off in my head and I sort of fell down the blockchain cryptocurrency rabbit hole and haven't come back since. Um, so anyway, what, what I'd like to do tonight is just kind of give you an overview of some of the uh, the main kind of legal implications, you know, regulatory issues facing cryptocurrencies. Uh, I, feel free to ask questions as we're going along, but I'll also leave some time. Carl. Yeah. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your career background as well, just as an introduction? Sorry, what was that? Your career background, like uh, besides cryptocurrency, uh, what do you do for a living? So I work at a law firm called Hanson Black Anderson Ashcraft. Um, our offices are at Thanksgiving Point. So uh, my, I did finance uh, undergrad at Utah State, law school at the U, and then I've been doing corporate and securities law ever since. So my interest, you know, as you'll find out, is definitely more from the kind of financial um, investment side than it is the technical side. That's why I went to law school. I have no technical abilities. So, um, so I'll kind of give you a brief overview and then I'll leave some time for questions at the end. But if you'd like, you can also ask questions as we're going along. So with cryptocurrencies, it's really interesting because traditional legal institutions and laws are not really set up for, for dealing with you know, autonomous organizations and protocols. So with your standard you know, kind of run-of-the-mill legal issues, everything is run by a person or a corporation, some sort of business entity. So if that entity is doing something against the law, then you get... You know, you can get a temporary restraining order. You can prevent whoever is taking that action from, you know, you can get them to stop doing whatever they're doing. But with an, an autonomous organization, there's, there's no one to stop. It's, it's a protocol that, that can't be stopped. So there are, there are going to be a lot of legal issues that need to be figured out that current, you know, legal and regulatory frameworks are inadequate for at this time. So some of the different areas that are, that are covered by, you know, legal issues raised by cryptocurrency include, um, you know, you hear all the time about criminal activity, the dark web that people love to use, you know, Bitcoin and some of these other privacy coins. Um, so that, you know, the government has an interest in tax evasion and anti-money laundering, you know, that that's what they're sort of, one thing they're sort of looking into cryptocurrencies at is, is how can they prevent you know, illegal and fraudulent transactions. There's a lot of securities laws that are implicated, you know, with the initial coin offerings, you know, initial token offerings that, is that a security, is it not? Is, you know, if it is, it's regulated by the SEC. So there's a lot of securities issues, tax, you know, the IRS wants to make sure that they're getting their cut of, you know, cryptocurrency transactions. So they're trying to figure out how to regulate it from a tax perspective. Consumer protection, if, you know, if these ICOs are, are really products, you know, that there needs to be some consumer protection laws that protect people who are buying the, the product. Uh, foreign currency, you know, how do you treat Bitcoin? Is it, is it a currency? Is it, is it something else? And then there's also federal versus state regulations. So some, some things like securities law are, are generally governed at a federal level and they for the most part will preempt state securities regulations. But there are some things that are governed. 
if you want to deal with, with cryptocurrency money transactions, converting it to and from fiat, you need to have a bit license. So a lot of this kind of stuff is, some of that stuff is governed at a state level. So I think a lot of us are sort of drawn to cryptocurrency because of the decentralized nature, because it can't be, you know, there's no government behind it that can corrupt it and ruin it. And so I think for a lot of people, they hear regulation and think, oh man, that's terrible. Like, well, that's the last thing we need is regulation, which often is true that when the government tries to regulate something, they don't do a very good job of it. They overregulate, they underregulate, they create additional problems. But at the same time, not all regulation is bad. So for example, Coin Center proposed like a, a national FinTech charter so that if you wanted to do money transmission, you wanted to operate an exchange or something where you're converting cryptocurrency to fiat, you could get one federal license instead of 50 state licenses. Or another example is if there was some sort of ICO framework, as long as it wasn't too restrictive, that could actually end up being a good thing. Because if you were doing an ICO, you could know exactly what you needed to do to stay within the law. So it's important to remember that sometimes regulation can actually be good and can foster innovation. Question? Yep. Uh, you, you mentioned the idea of like one federal law versus 50 state for the fiat to crypto conversion. Mm -hmm. Is that already in place or is that just being proposed? It's something that's been proposed oh, and isn't, isn't in place yet. So, I mean, the first thing is, okay, well, what, what is a cryptocurrency? Is it, is it money? You know, is it a currency? Is it a store of value? Is it property? Is it a commodity? Or something else entirely? So the thing that, that gets tricky about regulating cryptocurrency is sometimes it's any one of those or none of those, and you have different aspects of different currencies that, that look you know, that, that fit part of those. So it makes it kind of tough for regulators to, to come up with laws that, that really work because there are so many different things that cryptocurrency really is. So an example of why it matters, so there was a, a bankruptcy case called Hashfast. So in, in bankruptcy law, they have what are called preferential transfers. So let's say, I have a company, I've got a million dollars in debt, and I have $100,000 in cash left. So I owe my brother-in-law, so I pay him first. I pay him $100,000, and all the other creditors are left out in the cold. So when it goes up to bankruptcy, the bankruptcy trustee can look and, and kind of claw back anything that was a preferential transfer within a certain period of time. So this company goes into, before they went into bankruptcy, they made a payment and I think for all intents and purposes, it was a legitimate payment, and they made it in Bitcoin. So they paid you know, two or $300,000 in Bitcoin. So they, they enter into bankruptcy, and, and the, the bankruptcy trustee says, okay, you know, give, us the, give us the Bitcoin back. And the attorneys for, for the, the person that received the Bitcoin said, no, it's just like a currency, that it's just like getting paid in dollars. We'll send you $300,000 back, but in the meantime, the value of the Bitcoin had gone way up. So now the $300,000 of Bitcoin was worth 900,000 or something. So they said, well, we'll just give you back $300,000. That's the value of the time of the transfer. And so it kind of led to an interesting decision by the bankruptcy court that they had to decide, okay, what, what do we do? Do we just make them transfer the value back or the actual Bitcoin? And so they had to decide, what is it? That if, it was, if it's currency, then they could transfer the value back. But if it was, if it was property or, or something else, then it would, they'd need to send the Bitcoin back. And so the court sort of took a little bit of a, an easier way out and didn't totally address the issue, but basically said, it's enough to say that it's not, it's not currency in this instance, that it's more like a commodity or property. So they made the person give the Bitcoin back. So depending on you know, the classification, it can have all of these different ramifications, how it's treated in tax law, how it's treated in securities law. So that's something to kind of, you know, keep in mind. And, and different entities can sometimes treat it differently. So one of the big um, areas of regulation is securities regulation. So with the SEC, 
their job is to, is to protect investors from you know, fraudulent or illegal securities offerings. So if you, want to, if you want to sell securities in the United States, it either needs to be registered with the SEC or you need to have an exemption from registration. So there are a number of exemptions that you can use. You know, it's really expensive to register, to deal with the SEC. So most people, you know, unless you, it's large enough that you want to become a publicly traded company, you're going to try and find some sort of exemption so you don't need to, to go through the whole hassle of dealing with the SEC and getting everything approved. So one of the main ways that the SEC protects investors is through disclosure. So they say, okay, if you want to make a securities offering, you need to provide certain information that will allow investors to adequately assess the risks of the investment that they're going to make. And so they, they make a distinction between accredited investors and non-accredited investors. So if you are an accredited investor, in order to be a accredited investor, you have to have income of 200000 or more in the last two years or a net worth of over a million dollars, not including the value of your house. So the SEC sort of says, I mean, they, they kind of use wealth or income as a proxy for sophistication. So they basically say, look, if you can make that money, that much money every year, or you have that much money, then you don't need the same protections as someone that is less wealthy. So most private securities offerings only sell to accredited investors because your disclosure requirements are a lot less because the SEC is sort of deemed that they need, they're less in need of the SEC's protection. So in determining what is you know, a security or, or an investment contract, the SEC uses what's called the Howey test. So there's four elements. So it's, sometimes it's a little bit confusing that some people will talk about passing or not passing the Howey test. So if you pass the Howey test, that means you're a security, which is a little bit counterintuitive to me because it's like you, if you pass the test, it's, you don't want to be a security usually. So, um, so basically, it's, it's an investment of money with an expectation of profits in a common enterprise. And then the profits come from the efforts of others. So an example would be, let's say you want to invest in a venture capital fund. So you buy, you know, they set it up as a partnership. So the general partner is running the fund and the limited partners are the investors. So you buy limited partnership uh, interests in the fund. So you put money, that's your invest investment of money. Your expectation of profits is that the general partner is going to take the money. He's going to go out and invest in all these promising startup companies and make tons of money. So it's a common enterprise because you have all these investors pooling their money and then the general partner is running it. And the limited partners are relying on the general partner to, to take the money and to make something of it. So they're relying on the general partner's efforts to make a profit. So if you were to buy a limited partnership interest, that would be a security. So that brings us to the ICO. So does, does an ICO violate securities laws? Do you have a question? Do you have to pass all those? Yeah, all four. So if there's one that fails, then it's not a security. So with the question of whether or not an, an ICO violates securities laws, um, the first thing that I, I learned in law school, if you are ever asked, asked a question in class by the professor and you don't know the answer, you just say it depends and you're pretty much always right. <laughs> so no surprise that whether an ICO violates a securities law, the answer is it depends. So things have really started to, um, to come together in the last few months from a regulatory perspective. Um, you know, I gave this presentation three or four months ago and I was kind of amazed going back through the older slides how much things have changed. Um, I mean, I think people had a pretty good idea of what, I mean, you could take general securities offering principles and apply it to ICOs and get pretty close but now we actually have some information from the SEC about what, you know, what is a security and what isn't. So the way things are kind of starting to come down that everybody, like the sort of generally accepted um, 
you know, kind of standard wisdom is that there are two types of tokens that are being issued. And when I say token, I'm, I'm, I'm talking more like an, an ERC-20 token as opposed to like a currency like Bitcoin or Ethereum. That's something that's, that's built on top of the Ethereum or some other platform. That that's more what I'm, what I'm thinking about when I'm talking about an ICO. Um, so the first one is, is a utility token. So meaning the token has some sort of utility in the network that you're using it, you know, the, the network, you can mine coins on the network, you can, a token acts as a license to use the network, you know, to use the network's product, to add things to the network. And then a security token is, is basically people are trying to find a way, people say, oh man, this is great. Look how much money people are raising through an ICO. Let's go raise money through our business, for our business, and even though it's really, you know, let's offer them a dividend or let's offer them certain things. And then it just, it really ends up just being a securities offering where you're offering a token instead of, of stock. So things that sort of look like a securities offering, if you offer a dividend to the token holders, and, and there are certainly creative ways to kind of get around some of this stuff. But, but in general, if you offer a dividend, if the token offers any ownership in the entity that's issuing the IPO, if there's any debt, you know, if it, it acts like a debt instrument that you're receiving interest payments, if you're, you know, if you have claims against the company in the bankruptcy, then some of these things, it really just looks like a security that you've called a token. So the SEC recently came out with the DAO, you know, they, they came up with a decision and said, okay, we're going to analyze the DAO, and yes, this is a security. So if you go back to this token, they basically, the DAO was really just a venture capital fund where they issued tokens instead of limited partnership interests. So they said, you know, was there an investment of money? And they said, if you invest Ether or, or Bitcoin, it doesn't matter that it's not U.S. dollars, that counts as an investment of money. Expectation of profits. People were, were buying the DAO tokens. Sorry, just going back to something you mentioned earlier, in that case of the bankruptcy law, the court, I don't know which court ruled this, but you said that they didn't consider the uh, cryptocurrency to be, they considered it to be an asset, not a currency. So they made them give back the asset rather than the dollar amount that it was worth at the time they made the transaction. So in this case, though, like, are, are the courts conflicting or am I just not understanding this correctly? Because is it, I guess, this goes back to how are they defining money? Because here you're saying is it does pass this aspect of the Howey test. It is an investment in money. So, so, so when I was saying, like, it's a security if you have rights in the bankruptcy, is that kind of what you're referring to? So that's more like, let's say you bought Filecoin. And then Filecoin says, okay, in the event of bankruptcy, everybody gets back a portion. They get some claim on the assets of Filecoin. So it's more, if you buy the token and then that gives you rights against the company, so as opposed to just you know, holding just a transfer of Bitcoin, so it's more a right of the coin. So if you own Bitcoin, that doesn't give you any rights that if Bitcoin goes bankrupt. You see what I mean? Does yeah, that make yeah. sense? Okay. So. With, with the DAO, so they said, okay, everybody bought the DAO tokens with the idea that they would use the funds to invest in these different technologies and that people would get a return on it. So they bought it with the expectation of profits. It was a common enterprise. Carl? Yeah, I think just to maybe answer a little bit more what this guy's question is, it might be worth pointing out that like tokens um, each behave differently. Mm -hmm. right? so Mm -hmm. they yeah, exactly. exactly. So you have to look, in order to determine if a particular token is a security or not, you have to look and determine at all of the rights that are associated with that token and say, is the, these bundle of rights look like a security or does it look like a product? So what was interesting is, is Singapore four or five months ago came out and said, a token is not a security. So everybody said, oh, this is great. Let's all incorporate in Singapore and we can issue all of our ICOs in Singapore. And then a few months, fast forward a few months later, I mean, when I looked at that, I was like, well, 
how can they just make a blanket statement that all tokens are not? Because you could clearly make a token that has a bundle of rights similar to a security. So then it fast forward a few months later and they say, okay, never mind. Actually, some tokens really could be securities. So it's hard to make sort of blanket regulations because it's kind of a case by case analysis of each token of whether or not it's a security. So the common enterprise, everybody put their, you know, pulled their money to purchase the DAO tokens. And then the profits from the investments of others, you know, the SEC said, look, you know, granted there was this voting mechanism that people had kind of equal rights to vote on what projects were funded, which ones weren't. But they said that, you know, the people that were running it, the sort of curators, they were the ones that picked the, the companies, you know, the proposals to put forward. They had a lot of, you know, sway over which ones were voted on, which ones were even considered. And they said that's enough that it was, you know, kind of dependent on the efforts of those, those curators. So they said, look, the DAO is a security. Even though it was a token, just because you called it a token doesn't mean that it's not a security. So. Mm -hmm. However, if, you're, if something is declared to be a security, there's other rules that apply, like a wash sale rule, or there, mm -hmm. there's tons of them, and when you get into trading, you soon find those out, and you probably become really disappointed. So my question is, do you warn people, not just those who are starting out these ICOs, that there's, there's risk, regulatory risk involved, but people who are investing in them too, do you think this is something that the investors could get caught up in? And, and, Possibly face legal consequences for it? So, technically, there are rules that if you're an investor and you buy something that's an unregistered security, you're not supposed to then go on and distribute that to someone else. So, technically, if you're buying a securities token and selling it to somebody else, you are in violation of securities laws. But the chances of, I mean, the SEC has limited resources. So, I mean, in practice, it would be really hard for the SEC to go after any individual token holders. But technically, letter of the law, you're right. It would be a violation of securities laws to, to sell these things. So if you sort of say, OK, if I issue a securities token, that's going to just bring a whole host of legal issues. So I'm going to make sure my token is a, is a utility token so I don't have to deal with securities laws. So now you go to the utility token and People are saying, okay, now there's, there's a subset of utility tokens. There's the pre-functional token and the post-functional token. So a lot of these token pre-sales, they're selling the token based on a white paper, based on technical specifications of what they're going to do, but it's not actually up and running yet. So some people have, been, have made the point you know, pretty persuasively that if you're selling a pre-functional token, if you sell that token then, and you don't complete the rest of your development work, then that token is worthless. So if you go back to the, the Howey test, profits come from the efforts of others. So your pre-functional token now depends on the, you know, the, the efforts of the developers. That if they don't come through, your token is worthless. So you basically make the distinction that a pre-functional token, even if it's a utility token, is still a security. But once you get to that point where the network is sort of fully developed and functional, people start adding their own value, you know, supply and demand comes into play, people are using the network. At that point, it's not t so tied up in the development of you know, the actual founders of the network that it kind of takes on a life of its own. So people are saying, okay, so after you get to that point, then you can sell the tokens without violating securities laws because it's, you know, it's a utility token now and not a security. So the way people have sort of you know, tried to get around this is, is there's a, a security called a, a SAFT. So that stands for a simple agreement for future tokens. So in venture capital, they have what's called a SAFE, a simple agreement for future equity. So when you're very first starting up, it's hard to value the company. You know, you want to raise some seed money from investors, but you don't want to spend a bunch of time and money negotiating all of the terms of like a full Series A preferred stock deal. So what you do it in a, 
in a safe is you'd say, okay, we'll buy this right to future equity. So as soon as you do a Series A startup, my, my safe will convert into that you know, Series A preferred stock. So this sort of analogy to tokens is you, instead of selling pre-functional tokens, you sell the right to acquire the tokens at a future date when the network is functional. So you'd say, Whatever the, whenever the network's functional and you start selling tokens, I get them at a discount. So if you're selling tokens to everybody else when it's functional at a dollar, I can convert the money that I put in at eight and buy your tokens at 80 cents. So by doing that, so you're selling a security, so, that's, so you're limited to only accredited investors until you get to a functional network, and then you can sell it to everyone. So it's a little bit restrictive in that um, you know, kind of old rules, you're stuck with just accredited investors, but at the same time, it's, it's a good way to sort of, um, you know, protect yourself from SEC regulation. Do you have a question? Okay, so what if you've, uh, you're releasing a token, you're convinced that it's a utility token, you failed the Howie test, and so you feel pretty good about that, mm -hmm. but you're in the middle of your development, can you, can you write something in the, uh, your, your pre-sale that is a, a guaranteed reimbursement of funds if project is not complete at a certain stage. So for instance, um, uh, let's say your, your project just collapses before it mm -hmm. becomes uh, useful. Mm -hmm. then, then, then that kicks in that guaranteed reimbursement of the price of the token. Does that... I think that's still... No, because I think it's still a security because you're investing, I mean, it just lessens the risk to the investor, but it doesn't change the nature of the investment. But it's still a security because you have, in order for that investment to be worth something, you still need the promoters to follow through and develop the network. So it doesn't really change whether it's a security. So what's the difference between uh, a function utility token from the standpoint of being a security because it's sort of a security? What, what else is not it? Yeah, so what, what you do is you'd rely on, so you're not going to register it with the SEC. You're just going to go through the same fundraising mechanism that every other startup does. That you find an exemption which allows you to sell to accredited investors. Yeah. So if you your your disclosure requirements are different, and you don't have to provide the same level of, you know, detail about what, you know, detailed financials and, um, you know, a full like PPM or something like that. Did you have a question? So um, would Tezos be an example of a like yeah. plus set, say, like where I don't know if the tokens actually are really out there yet, but. So I, I don't know specifically how Tezos did it. So Filecoin, I think they were the first ones to use the SAFT. So they, you know, they've complied with all of the sort of securities laws and, and used the SAFT. So they were kind of the, the pioneers of the, the SAFT. Okay, so then, okay, so ICO best practices. So if you're doing an ICO, I mean, in general, well, let, me, let me take a step back. So you can still do a securities token. So blockchain capital, for example, raised money. They created a token. They raised money. They went through, um, you know, they, they cleared everything with, with the SEC. So you can certainly do a securities token if you want. It just, you just lose some of the benefits of an ICO. So in general, you know, you want to create a token that's, that's integral to the network. It's a utility token. It provides value to the network, and it's not just an add-on, you know, that you're trying to use it just so you can raise more money. Because um, if, you, if you're doing it as a utility token, it's so much easier to trade. You're not subject to securities laws. 
that you know it's it, it really works much better for a a utility token than it does for a securities token. So using the SAFT is a, is a really good idea. I mean, there are some people that think that even some utility tokens can still be considered a security. And so, you know, they, they'd say, well, even basically all ICOs are security. So you're still, you know, there is still some risk. But the way I look at it is there are a number of things that you can do to sort of, you know, de-risk an ICO. So in general, the SEC has limited enforcement power. I mean, they have limited people that can go out and investigate these things, that can prosecute people. So, I mean, in general, they're looking for the, for the low-hanging fruit. So if you're doing everything you can to comply, you're trying to make it not a securities token, you're using a SAFT so that your pre-functional token is not a security. Um, you know, you're, you're only selling to accredited investors prior to your functional token. That if you're doing all of these things, you can do a lot to make it, you know, a lot less risky. That if the SEC did come look at you, I mean, you can say, look, we did everything we possibly could. Um, you, you know, we didn't sell any tokens prior to it being a functional network. And, you know, you have pretty good arguments about, do you have a question in the back? way to keep track of your, your table, right? Like so, slicing pie. Yeah. So that, I mean, that definitely sounds more like a utility token that you're using it for a function. And so when, you know, part of the test is that you're buying something with an expectation of profits. It gets a little bit murky because you could be buying the token because you want to use it and also because you want it to, to increase in value. So just because something increases in value and you make a profit on it doesn't mean that it's a security. So what you were saying sounds more like a utility token because it's used for a particular function and, and doesn't look like equity. So that goes to the very bottom one, have a plan and stick to it. So the SEC wants you to say, okay, if you're telling these people this is what they're gonna get, that these are the risks, this is what the network's gonna do, you gotta stick to it because that's what, you, that's what you promise people. So the more you can stick to your plan and live up to the promises you made that people made their decision whether or not to purchase your token, the better off you are. So, you know, another thing you can do is a lot of people don't like the term ICO because it sounds too close to IPO, which sounds too close to a securities offering. So, you know, don't use language that where you emphasize that it's an investment, you're gonna make tons of money. Um, you know, as you start doing those things that it sounds like you're trying to convince people to purchase it for the profit aspect and not for the utility of the network. Um, you'll wanna consider the tax ramifications. So, if you go out and sell you know, $100 million in tokens, you now have $100 million of taxable income. So you know, the, the thing about a security is if you sell $100,000 in equity, you don't have tax on it because you're, you sold equity, which is different than selling you know, a, a good or service. So if you're saying, if you're making the argument, okay, this, this is a product, it's not a security. Well, the downside is you sold a product, so now you have 100 million in income. So I don't know how all of this works, but some people are looking at you know, a Cayman Islands entity to deal with the tax issues. I read somewhere that that you know, may or may not work, that if you're still operating everything out of the US, even if you have a Cayman Islands entity, it may not work, but it's like When you go and set up a, I mean, okay, you're a U.S. company, you do this huge ICO, which I know there's a Salt Lake company that did, mm -hmm. and then as soon as they got done, they bounced. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if I'm the, I'm just 
devil's advocate, but I'm thinking the IRS is going to come down really hard on that. So I, I tend to agree with you that like, it can't be that easy, right? To just form a subsidiary in the Cayman Islands and yeah. So I, I mean, I don't, I'm not a tax attorney, so I don't know how all of that works, but I, I tend to agree with what you're saying that if it sounds too good to be true that you can avoid that much in tax, it probably is. But at the same time, I mean, there are funds, all kinds of different funds that are based out of the Cayman Islands. And it does work, you know, for example, if you're actually operating from the Cayman Islands, it works. You know, you can... Do you know how the IRS is treating the profits of day traders um, when they're doing coins? Are they being taxed on each individual trade or only when it comes back in the U.S. dollars since they're treating it as property? So I have a slide on taxes. So I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. Brian, so a lot of the stuff you've been talking about focuses more on the, the developer of the company, the you know, folks issuing the tokens. What are the implications on the recipients? Uh, so for example, you know, I, I think it's fair to say, because of all this regulatory uncertainty, that's why a lot of these ICOs are happening elsewhere, outside mm -hmm. the United States. And an increasing number are just saying up front, we don't allow United States citizens to participate. Mm -hmm. So let's say, for example, um, I set up a VPN to get around their IP address block so they can't tell, you know, they think I'm in France. Mm -hmm. And I participate in the ICO. Um, does the SEC, my understanding is the SEC cares more about the company uh, and their actions rather than me as an informed consumer intentionally circumventing their, you know, CYA policy. Yep. Do I have, in this theoretical example, because I've never done this at all, uh, <laughs> do, I, do, I, do I, in this the purely theoretical example, have any risk in, in SEC enforcement or do they not care about I think it's, yes, you do. I mean, if you are... If you're making representations to the company that aren't true, I mean, one, it's, it could be a breach of contract to the company that's selling you the token because you've you know, falsified your information. I mean, yeah, it could be a violation of SEC laws, but it goes back to, you know, at the end of the day, who are they gonna go, go after? The one purchaser or the company that's defrauded, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. So, you know, it's technically, yeah, you probably are in violation of the law, but it seems kind of low risk. So uh, I don't participate in the ICO because I'm a law-abiding citizen. And, um, but when the token is then publicly traded on an exchange, I exchange lawfully owned Bitcoin for this token. The, the policy, the, the law doesn't run with the token wherever it goes. Mm -hmm. So how does the exchange change the nature of these tokens, whether they're utility tokens or more security type? Once it's publicly traded, all hell breaks loose. How does that work? So I actually have a slide for that too, so I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. Okay, and so, and, and you know, one ICO best practice I, I had on there before but took off was, you know, a lot of people, like you were saying, are, you know what, I don't even want to deal with U.S. law, so I'm not going to offer it to any U.S. citizens. So that is something that's, that's pretty common, that if you're, if you're worried about, you know, dealing with U.S. laws and regulations, then... Um, you know, not offered U.S. citizens. However, if you're operating out of the U.S., you're still subject to certain U.S. laws. Um, so you'll want to provide, you know, a short relevant disclosure about, you know, your white paper should say what the network does, what, you know, what, what the risks are of the token, but try not to use all of the same kind of securities laws, you know, reps and warranties and disclaimers that make it look like an investment. So, okay, taxes. So, virtual currency is treated by the IRS as property and not foreign currency for federal tax purposes. So, one thing, that, so this is, it's kind of like a lot of this stuff, it's kind of a double-edged sword. So, with a foreign currency, if you have 100 euros and you use that 100 euros, you're not paying, you don't pay taxes if the, the exchange rate between euros and dollars fluctuates. That, you know, if you use it for 100, I mean, if you use it to purchase goods and services, you're not subject to the increases. 
with, with Bitcoin, the thing that's a little bit tricky, and there are some you know, proposed legislation out there right now to kind of solve this problem, but it's like, you know, if you have a Bitcoin and you're using it as currency, every time, let's say you go out and you purchased a Slurpee from 7-Eleven with Bitcoin, that's a taxable transaction. You have to look at what your basis was, what you bought it for. You know, I, that dollar's worth of Bitcoin that I used, I bought it for 80 cents. So now I have 20 cents of, you know, taxable gain. So, so yeah, if, depending on how long you've held it. So that's, that's the good and the bad, though, is that, and, and we'll get to it with the character of the gain or loss. Um, so I'll come back to that in a second. So, but Bitcoin, here's where it gets tricky again. So you're taxed on it in the same way, like if you're receiving it for goods and services. So I'm an attorney. I accepted a payment a week ago in Ethereum for legal services. So that's taxable income to me as if the person had paid it in dollars. So if you're receiving Bitcoin, you're subject, you know, for, for, for selling, selling goods or services, you're subject to the same taxes as if you had paid, um, if you just received US dollars. So for example, if you're paid $1,000 in Ethereum equivalent today, mm -hmm. and then that $1,000 worth of Ethereum becomes $2,000 at the end of the year, how do you then, do you say, well, when I got it, it was worth this much, therefore the taxes would be this much because it happened then? Is that how that would work? Yeah, so, so going to the next one, um, so the character of gain or loss depends if it's being held um, as a capital asset or ordinary property. So for me, if I receive the payment in Bitcoin, I've got $1,000 of income, and then every appreciation on top of that, if I'm holding it as an investment, is subject to capital gains tax. So it's treated differently than just ordinary income tax. But isn't it true that that is not calculated until you cash that out in some way? Right? Yeah, that's right. So. That's right. So the, in your example, so the $1,000 I received, I pay tax on that, I include it in my income tax, and then I don't pay tax on the gain until I sell that, the ether. So to be clear, when you first get it, the government sees this as a currency, <laughs> and once you hold it, they treat it as property. <laughs> yeah, it is clear as mud, right? So, and if you're mining, so for miners, you're taxed on the day you receive the coin. So you receive a coin for mining, then it's taxable at the value that day, and then as it goes up, then you have the capital gains taxes. So how, how is the trade transfer between cryptocurrency? Like I bought um, Bitcoin, and then went up, and then I bought Ethereum. So Are they still out there, like the, the, the IRS is thinking about it? Do you actually? The way, the way I have understood this is if you are trading from one currency into the next, that it's not a taxable event. So, I mean, the, the accountant I heard that from, I mean, that sounds right to me, but I don't know for sure. And I'm, but from what I've heard that if you're going from cryptocurrency to cryptocurrency, you don't, you don't have the tax until you convert back into fiat. Mm -hmm. various transactions, and they're under the opinion that any conversion between one crypto and another is also a taxable event, which just becomes an absolute nightmare. Yeah. But um, anyway, it seems like people are getting conflicting legal advice on yeah. this, so I, I don't know what the right answer is. Yeah, I think <laughs> it's funny because um, someone, someone asked the same question at the last presentation, and I gave Carl's answer that I, well, I thought, well, this probably sounds like a taxable event. So I gave the reverse answer here, and then got got corrected again. So I, I can't win either way. So I'm not trying to blame you at all. No, no, I appreciate you saying that because yeah, that just shows that yeah. like you talk to one accountant, he'll tell you one thing. You talk to another accountant, he'll tell you a different thing. Yeah. Because the IRS has not produced enough, yeah. 
you know, guidance of what you need to do. Do you know whether the IRS will treat that um, capital gains on the ruling a year and a day, whether it's taxed under a year and a day or over a year and a day, depending on? I would think it would be subject to sh the same, you know, short-term, long-term capital gains. But if I move it around into different coins and stuff and then pull it out to U.S. dollars? So that depends on, on what Carl was saying. Is each time you trade a coin, is that a taxable event? Or is it more of like a like kind exchange that's not subject to? I think one of the things that's important to do is consider where, what the source of the information is. Mm -hmm. like with consensus, they have an interest yeah. in moving a product that treats everything as a taxable event because it's a tax account. Yeah, well, I actually, I actually would say um, my opinion on them is they're almost the ones sort of making this space right now, and they are very, very pro mm -hmm. or uh, trying to remove regulation as much as possible. And while they are building a product for it, um, it kind of seems to me like they are just trying to make sure they don't get in trouble. That's that's the impression I get. Oh, but, uh, yeah. an abundance of caution, and then yeah. they say, hey, we've been so cautious, let's create something that makes everybody else that cautious. But, yeah, but one of the big challenges here that I see in making crypto to crypto a taxable event is that it's so volatile mm -hmm. that you become responsible for a taxable event that like a few days later you could like lose your shirt on, yeah you know and so mm -hmm. it just it seems really difficult in a lot of ways yeah that's why i prefer i mean not that my preference matters to the irs but i think it makes more sense to do it that way where if you're going crypto to crypto that's not a taxable event that's a like kind exchange and you don't you don't you shouldn't be taxed on it until you cash back out into 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 fiat. I'm curious, so you mentioned that that when it comes to enforcement efforts on the SEC side. On the IRS side, do you assume that they're going to take a low hanging fruit approach in that, I mean, there's so many cryptos out there and it would be so easy for a person to do all this tax evasion and so difficult to prosecute. Even like traditional financial channels, right? If I get audited, right? There's there's a paper trail for mm -hmm. almost everything I've bought, okay? And that's hard enough. Um, then when you're getting into, oh, did he use this wallet to buy this or this to buy that? I mean, it just seems... It is pretty hard to track. So what the IRS has done, they tried to subpoena records from Coinbase. So I can't, I'm, I mean, I'm making up the numbers here because I can't remember what the numbers were, but it was something like, they said, okay, between 2013 and 2016, you know, give us, you know, your top, 200,000 or 300,000 or whatever the number was, um, give us all your records so we can see their trading records to see what money they made. And Coinbase said, no, 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 that's way too broad. You need to limit it to a particular dollar amount that you know, only accounts over $200,000 or $300,000. So that's basically where they're gonna really be able to figure things out is records on exchanges like Coinbase. I would caution though that, that approach about kind of low hanging fruit, the IRS, the different statutory structures that the IRS sees it as the burden of proof is on the taxpayer. It's not the same in the other agencies, right? And so they basically, if they interpret it something some way, you have to basically marshal your evidence to show why they're wrong. And if you cannot do that, they always win. Totally different structure. So you don't want to ever get in a situation where you're you know, basically daring them to, to come after you or structure it that way. They always win that way. And we've done several odds with the IRS involving millions of dollars. And it is not fun. And the burden of proof is on your side. And they, they basically just state, here's our position. You have to come basically expend your resources, either in tax court or on a basis of, of uh, you know, a, an officer's and agent's review to demonstrate why it's not the case. So you're always on the other side. It's totally different with SEC or prosecutorial criminal activity that's different. This is the IRS is different. So that, that's right, it is different, but by the same token, it's the same principle that like, if I have a $2,000 Coinbase account, the IRS really doesn't care if I, you know, underpaid by a couple hundred dollars versus somebody that bought Bitcoin at the beginning and now has 
tens of millions of dollars in Bitcoin, they're a lot more interested in auditing someone like that. Yeah, one other thing I would point out is that um, actually people think that all this crypto stuff is hard to track, and I think I kind of agree with that, but also it's all in a public ledger. Mm -hmm. And a lot of government agencies are currently working on software to analyze these public ledgers and trace you know, the flow of funds as they travel around. And mm -hmm. um, I know FBI is working on that, and I'm yeah. sure other agencies are as well. So um, let's say, for example, that Coinbase is required to release some of their fund records, and suddenly individuals become tied to public addresses on mm -hmm. the Ethereum blockchain. Then suddenly um, you can start to say, oh, Bob is sending money to Alice, and you can, yep. you can start to create quite a big paper trail, and you can do it actually a lot easier yeah. than trying to collect paper receipts, right? So yep. in, in some ways, it may even be easier than tracking down mm -hmm. regular funds. You know? that's, that's a great point, because as soon as you know somebody's public address, you can see every transaction that's ever happened with that address. So going back to kind of some of the regulations that have happened to date, um, you know, so we've had some notable SEC actions. We talked about the Dow. Um, I think it was this week or last week, the SEC went after two ICOs, one called Recoin, Real, RE for real estate, and then another one called DRC, which was like diamond, something diamond, um, run by the same guy. So this guy basically said, okay, I've got, you send me your money, you purchase these tokens, and then these tokens will be secured by, by real estate. I'm going to go out and buy all these, real, this, you know, these different properties with the money. So your token is totally secured with this real estate. So he took the money and then didn't buy any real estate. And then he did another ICO where he said, if you buy these tokens, you can use them to buy discounted diamonds. So he took in the ICO money and then never bought any diamonds. So when I talk about low hanging fruit, that's Recoin and DRC. So if you're using SAFs and you're using everything you can, you know, to comply with laws, those are the people that they're going to go after first. So that doesn't mean if you're violating securities laws, you mean you're, you know, the SEC can't come after you, but it's just sort of a first level. The first thing they're looking for is fraud, that they're going to go after fraud, and then they'll sort of worry about, you know, securities and other violations. And a, and a lot of the risk, too, is um, you may have a totally legitimate ICO, but it's when things go bad that that's when, you know, that it kind of matters what, what you did in the past. I was going to ask, um, I don't remember if you have ever mentioned, are you affiliated with the SEC in some way or just helping with the legal, your clients with legal? No, so we just, um, we're not affiliated with the SEC. We just help people to manage, you know, SEC regulations, comply with SEC laws and regulations. Um, you know, Protostart was another one. They were in the middle of their pre-sale. The SEC called them up, and they said, guess what? What you guys are doing looks like a security. And so they said, oh, man, this is it's going to be too much work to try and fight it and change the SEC. So they said, okay, we're going to shut things down. We're going to give all the money back, and we're just going uh, to give up. So one thing that's interesting, though, one point I will make on the securities tokens. So... Um, Overstock has a division called Medici, and they also, so they're working on a product called uh, T0, which is basically a securities compliant token exchange. So, I mean, I, I, as a securities attorney, I think that token securities have like amazing potential, that you can tokenize all kinds of assets, and there are a lot of, you know, benefits to doing that. So, T0 is trying to sort of set up an exchange for trading tokens that are securities um, that, that allow you to sort of comply with securities laws. But the thing that I don't really understand with what they're trying to do is that's great if you're listed. I mean, I, th I do think it's great that if you're listed, you know, you have a securities token trading on their exchange. But the question is, what do you need to do before so that you can get listed on the exchange? And then what are your ongoing obligations after? Do you have to have audited financials? Do you have to provide quarterly and, and annual reports, just like a public company? And then it basically is like, well, okay, you're essentially just a de facto public company. So, but I, I do think it's definitely a step in the right direction. Um, a lot of countries in the last couple months have come out with 
you know, regulations relating to um, ICOs. Um, oh, and one thing I forgot to mention, um, one of the interesting things in the Dow decision is they, the SEC basically said that Ethereum itself is not a, is not a security. So that was, I mean, that may have been the biggest thing that came out of it. So you don't have to worry about things like Bitcoin and Ethereum being securities. So the SEC has sort of said, okay, these are not, it's more the tokens that are issued on top. Um, so countries with recent news, you know, China has, there's been a lot about, they banned ICOs. Um, I think they, they shut down some of their local exchanges. I think a big part of it is they were having issues with fraud you know, not just in ICOs, but in other, um, like some, I heard that some of the exchanges were just taking, I don't know if it was more like a, an investment brokerage kind of thing, where they were just taking their clients' money and putting it into cryptocurrency without asking. So some of what I think of what China's doing is they're just trying to like, okay, let's, let's put a temporary ban, let's try and get a hold of this, and then we'll kind of reevaluate things. South Korea, you know, kind of similar. They, they didn't go after the exchanges, but they went after um, the basic ICOs who said, look, we're not going to do ICOs. The rest of those countries listed basically came out and said, um, actually, other than Ukraine, but those other countries on there came out and said, okay, we're not going to put a blanket ban on ICOs. We're going to say it's a case-by-case -case basis. Some ICOs are securities and some are, are products. So if you are issuing an ICO that's a security, then you have all kinds of regulations to deal with. Um, so kind of a, a middle ground approach. So what I sort of see going forward, um, I mean, I, I see that the SEC and the IRS, you know, as kind of the two main entities that have an interest in, um, in regulating. You know, the IRS, because they, they want their taxes, they don't want people using, you know, cryptocurrency to not pay taxes on. And then the SEC, because, because of the ICOs, you know, because of investor protection, they recently created a, a cyber crime unit to go after fraudulent ICOs. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if at some point they come out with some sort of framework for ICOs um, you know, that says, okay, if you, if you want to do an ICO, these are the kind of hoops you have to jump through. If it's, if it's a utility token, even if it's a utility token, you still need to provide this base level of disclosure. You know, every 90 days, you need to provide an update of your, uh, of your progress. So all the people that bought, you know, um, tokens know what's going on. So something like that, I wouldn't be surprised if maybe there was, um, you know, if they came out with some sort of framework to, correct, to try and deal with that. What's your sense of how, um, how much resources the, the SEC has to, to go after this stuff right now? Is, is, are they just like struggling really bad or are they getting a lot of funding? Or what, what, what? So if you look at the SEC, you know, if you look at their total budget as a pie, it feels like the ICO pie the cryptocurrency pie is growing because there's so much activity in the space. There's so much that they need to deal with. You know, they recently just came out with this new cybercrime unit. So I think they're probably, I mean, if I was running the SEC, I would take money from other programs and enforcement actions that aren't, you know, receiving as much attention and put more of it into ICOs. Um, and then there's, I mean, I think there's the potential to go after exchanges that if they really wanted to get, um, you know, serious about regulating cryptocurrencies. I mean, that's would be the place to start is to go after all these exchanges and say, Hey, you are selling unlicensed securities. This is illegal. Um, so, I mean, there have been some exchanges there over the last couple of months that said, look, we're going to evaluate and we're just going to get rid of anything we think is potentially a securities token. So that's something that, that I could definitely see happening because that's, you know, one action that would sort of have a really big effect on, on these securities tokens. Um, but like I was saying, with the countries that are still allowing ICOs, but just kind of evaluating it on a case-by-case -case basis, um, you know, I feel like they are taking kind of a measured approach. There is, in the United States, they have like a blockchain caucus 
like specifically for congressmen to join that are interested in blockchain technologies that you know a lot of sort of forward thinking progressive politicians that can see the value of the blockchain and they don't want to stifle the innovation so i mean there definitely are people you know regulators in every branch that that realize the potential and so they are trying to kind of you know not squash the innovation um, which which is smart because as you can see any comp any country that over regulates so this is i mean cryptocurrencies are this is a worldwide phenomenon so any country that over regulates and becomes too restrictive they're just going to push all that innovation out of their country and into another one so I mean, even though U.S. laws are restrictive and there are a lot of people that don't want to deal with them, I mean, the U.S. knows and a lot of other countries know, look, if we, if we come down too hard, we're going to lose a lot of money and a lot of innovation in our country. So, I mean, I think partly there will be, you know, new laws and institutions that will need to be created that will need to, to catch up. I mean, I think we're, we're starting to see that a little bit with ICO regulation that regulators are finally starting to kind of um, to catch up a little bit. I mean, it's always kind of a catch-up game that you're always so, the, the space is changing so rapidly that it's hard for um, regulators to catch up. So that's it. Any other, uh, any other questions? Do you see uh, stuff like Monero that can be anonymous, mm -hmm. just creating a space where it's like Wild West and the regulators are like, well, we're not going to put our resources yeah, I think with, with the privacy coins, um, I mean, you can see the value of them because, you know, like you're saying, if the, if the IRS gets your public address for Bitcoin or Ethereum, you know, they can track everything. So, I mean, I think that they'll just have to try other means, um, you know, to tax Monero transactions, but it's definitely going to be a lot harder for them. This is maybe a little off topic because I want someone to hold this toward the end, but I know that some of the uh, trust companies that are handling self-directed IRAs mm -hmm. are not allowing their people to invest in, in cryptocurrencies. Mm -hmm. what, what, are you, what do you know? So there, there are companies that, I mean, I think it's called like Bitcoin IRA or something, that they are specifically setting up retirement accounts to invest in cryptocurrency. So that, I mean, I, I, it'll eventually either get to the point, you know, where some of, you know, the, the early adopters are saying, you know, there's a need for this, let's set it up so that people can do it. And then I think eventually the, the kind of more traditional IRAs and retirement account, you know, trusts that are managing things will probably come around. But if not, you can always just go to a, you know, a, a kind of more startup that'll, that allows for it about um, the, the U.S. dollar tether by Bitfinex out of Hong Kong, um, stability or infrastructure, anything behind it? I've heard of it, but I don't, I don't really understand enough of it to answer any questions on it. Any other questions? If not, I'll be, uh, I'll be sticking around for a little bit if anybody has any, uh, any questions after. Thanks Sorry, for coming.